<laughs> Thank you all. It is always a delight to get to speak to the friendliest of groups, so thank you. There are a couple things I want us to make sure we are very familiar with before we actually look at the funeral chorales. First, it's the whole trombone choir tradition. The earliest citation of the use of wind music within the Moravian congregation in Herrenhut is from 1729. Remember that Herrenhut was just founded in 1722. Um, 1731 is the first note in the records of the trombones accompanying the singing at a funeral. 1745, the single brothers woke themselves up with trumpets and gathered in the square, and they awoke the congregation by singing and playing trombones at 3.30 in the morning. Um, 1745, the trombones called the, consecrate, the congregation to the consecration of the newly built brother's house. This is all in Herrenhut. 1747, December 31st, the brass choir played a verse at midnight for the congregation to sing along. So brass bands have been so much a part of our worship for 250 years. So the band calls the congregation to special services. In the settlement towns and congregations, you really can hear the band from all over town. The band plays to accompany singing at funerals, Easter service, watch night, and other special services. So the function of the trombone choir in general was to expand the liturgical space. It's to remind you that even the outdoors is a worship space. Um, why trombones? Why didn't they use a full brass choir in Herrenhut in the early years? There's two reasons. Like the most things Moravian, one reason is practical, and the other reason is theological. The theological one first. The Moravians were using Martin Luther's translation of the Bible into German. <clears throat> and there's places wherein we read about the last trumpet, Matthew 24. And he will send his angels out with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. 1 Corinthians 15, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die. We will all be changed in a moment at the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead will be raised. 1 Thessalonians 4, for the Lord himself with a cry of command, with the archangel's call and the sound of God's trumpet will descend from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise first. Well, in Martin Luther's translation into German, the word there is posauna. It's trombone. The last trombone will sound. Eric's over there cheering. <laughs> it is God's trombone that's going to call us to judgment. All those angels in Revelation with the seven trumpets, near Martin Luther, and in the life of the Moravians, there were their trombones. And the angel played the seventh trombone. So, so, okay, there's your theological reason. The practical reason? Well, the trumpet as we know it now, with the valves on top and all that, that wasn't invented yet. The only way you could get all the notes of a melody on a trumpet in the 18th century was if you had a really, really good lip and you could play in the high of the range of the overtone series and get all those individual notes out. It took a virtuoso player. The valve brass instruments as we know them now were invented in the 1830s. So if you were gonna get melody lines in a brass instrument, you had to use a trombone because it had this slide and it could play them all. Also, trombones come in sizes. So well, those are less familiar today than they were 300 years ago. The little soprano trombone about this long plays in the range of a soprano voice. Then the, excuse me, the alto, the tenor, and the bass, you could get four-part chorale harmony with trombones. Uh, so you could play all the parts. There's the trombone choir. Theologically, it's God's. Practically, you can play all the notes. So. Um, do trombone choirs still exist today? Yep. Salem Trombone Choir was um, here, was in existence for a long time, morphed into what is now the Salem Band and the full band that plays for Easter and everywhere. But, but the Salem Trombone Choir was reestablished in the 1980s. Bethlehem Trombone Choir has been in continuous existence since 1742. Downey, California, um, at what was the Downey Moravian Church, formed a trombone choir with uh, players from the Los Angeles Philharmonic Orchestra. Um, in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, uh, Glenwood Moravian Church has a trombone choir. It's a very good group. It's been going for 30 years or so. 
So there's the trombones. There, that's what, what happened. The second thing we need to review before we go specifically to the funeral chorales is the, the other piece of this puzzle. One piece is we've got trombones out there expanding the liturgical space, reminding you that all of life is sacred. The other piece of this puzzle is the choir system. I still get amused when I think that in a group for whom music is so important, for the German, for the Moravians, the, the German word chor or choir doesn't have anything to do with music. That's weird. The 18th century Moravians used the word bond too, B-A-N-D. That doesn't have anything to do with music either, but that's another talk. Huh? <laughs> The choirs were an outgrowth of Zinzendorf's recognition that people at different stages of life have different spiritual understandings and different spiritual needs. The spiritual state of a boy of 15, for instance, is likely to be really, really different from the spiritual experience of a widow of 85. So the Herrenhut community and the others that followed were divided into choirs or groups by age, sex, marital status. Each choir had its own spiritual leader responsible for knowing and guiding the spiritual life of all the choir members. Each choir had meetings, the single sisters choir, single brothers, the married people's choir, the little boys, the little girls, widows, widowers. They worshiped as individual choirs and worshiped together with the whole community. In some towns like Salem, the single brothers and single sisters had their own houses. And some had a widow's house as well. Some of us have lived in the Bethlehem widow's house. Um, you moved from choir to choir as you went through the stages of life, and there were rituals for your acceptance into, for instance, the single sisters choir when you had been in the older girls choir, the recognition that your life is in a different stage. Um, every community recognized single sisters, single brothers, married people, widows, widowers, some communities recognize the older girls, older boys, little girls, and little boys. Now, let's take this to an extreme, which some places did. Some places recognized the embryos choir, which, conveniently enough, met at the same time as the pregnant sisters choir. <laughs> now, we think that's silly until you think about more recent research about the effect of, of prenatal experiences, music and the like, the effect on the growing child. They really were ahead of their time in a lot of ways. Um, each choir also had its own choir hymn, a, a tune and a verse especially associated with that choir. Now those tunes aren't used only for the choir hymns. They're all familiar to other words in the past and present body of Moravian hymnody. In fact, there are very, very few tunes in Moravian history that are associated with only one set of words. Oh, most of them you'll sing different words to at different times. So the designation of a particular tune for each of the choirs might have been done by Moravian composer and teacher Christian Greger. We don't know, but it was well established before Zinzendorf died in 1760. Uh, the full set of choir tunes with a hymn stanza associated to each was printed in the liturgical hymns of 1791 and also later editions, but the practice seems to have been well established a long time before it was put in print. Publication follows practice. So, memorizing hymns was the norm. Uh, Zinzendorf felt like the printed hymnal was for the use of visitors or maybe for private devotions, but in order for hymns to be really effective, they needed to be memorized, or as we say, known by heart. I think it's wonderful that we don't say, man, we don't say memorizing, we don't say known by head. We don't know it in my mind, we know it by heart, because then it has sunk in. And you know how it is then, if you hear, if you know a song or a hymn really well, you hear the first three or four notes, and you know what the words are. So the practice of having the trombone choir, remember the trombone choir? Announce the death of a member of a choir, there's the choir system, is recorded as early as 1751 uh, in Ebersdorf, a different German town. Uh, the death announcement, as it was, incorporated three chorales. The first was the Passion Chorale. So if you lived in Herrenhut or Lidditz or Salem or any of the congregations anywhere and you heard from the balcony or the, the balcony or the belfry, balcony, belfry or the highest point, you heard the trombone choir 
And they played, I think that my page turned right, they played, you went, you think, uh-oh, somebody died. Now, this is a small town, remember. There's not a lot of people here. You probably know who's been sick, but there could have been an accident. Somebody could have fallen. Somebody could have had a sudden heart attack. They might not be sick. So the second chorale is going to tell you more about that. But before we look at the specific choir tunes then, let's look at the first one you find in your booklet, the one titled Announcement of Death. The music is not by a Moravian. Uh, its first appearance of the patoon we know as the Passion Chorale was published in a collection of dancing tunes in 1601. Um, its first religious setting was with a funeral hymn in 1613, not among the Moravians, but the Moravians soon took it in, along with many other denominations. The words, A Pilgrim Us Preceding, come from the Moravian Liturgy Book of 1823, of course in German. The words, again, were likely in use a long time before they were published. Uh, the German was translated by Frederick Detterer, who was a teacher at Moravian College, and he was assistant secretary of publications in Bethlehem. So I guess he's the precursor of the guys who print the daily text now. Looking at those words, a pilgrim us preceding in grace has been called home, the final summons heeding which soon to all must come. Oh joy, the chains to sever which burden pilgrims here to dwell with Christ forever who to our souls is dear. A pilgrim. This reflects the understanding that we're all pilgrims. We're all travelers. A pilgrim is a traveler on a journey towards a holy place. That's us. That's all of us. Has been called home reflects the Moravian sense that dying is a summons to come home. Uh, being called to the more immediate presence of the Savior. So in our dying, as well as in our living, we are responding to the call of our Savior. The um, final summons heeding which soon to all must come. In our conscious thought is the recognition, the realization that each one of us is going to be called home. This is important in light of the very human tendency to push aside the things we might not want to think about. We live in a world that wants to deny the reality of death. This doesn't let us. To dwell with Christ forever, that's the holy place to which we as pilgrims are traveling. So that's the first hymn. We never get to sing this one. Let's sing it. You've just heard that chorale. Those words are in your memory. They're in your heart. You've sung that with, in your heart now. The second tune that the trombone choir played identified the choir of the person who has gone home. So we're going to take a quick walk through those hymns before we talk about the final chorale. The Married Brothers choir tune date, the tune dates from 1648. Uh, attributed to Johann Kruger, who was a music director in Berlin. He worked with the prolific Lutheran hymn writer Paul Gerhardt. Kruger is attributed with no less than 122 hymn tunes. Uh, 
This tune was adapted by Christian Greger. It appears twice in our Moravian Book of Worship, uh, both times with a hymn reaffirming the reality of the resurrection. Jesus, my Redeemer, lives. It's one of them. Uh, the text here is similar. It affirms that Jesus never forsakes the believer. Um, and the final line of this hymn, herein precious comfort lies, I shall in his image rise. That comes straight from 1 Corinthians 15, that wonderful chapter where Paul asserts the reality, he argues for the reality of the resurrection. Um, he writes, um, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the physical and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. We will rise in Jesus' image. Oh, how am I doing on time? We just don't have time to sing all of these. I'll tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and talk, and what time we have left, we'll sing. The Married Sisters hymn, turn the page. Um, tune originated as a folk song. Um, the words are by Paul Gerhardt, that most prolific of Lutheran hymn writers. Um, Gerhardt lived from 1606 to 1676. Now, I want to know more about Gerhardt, having read uh, what Al Frank said about him in the Companion to the Moravian Book of Worship. Al writes, Gerhardt's personal spiritual journey was tumultuous, and his success as a Lutheran, Lutheran clergyman cannot be measured by any worldly standards. Despite being interdicted from performing any clerical functions, whoo, <laughs> He continued to express his faith through the deep spiritual wealth which flowed from his pen. There are stories there. So. But looking at these words, his plea amid deep sighing, amid bitter tears and crying, my soul with peace has blessed. We remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Take this cup away from me. With sighing and with tears. Uh, wishing there was some way to push aside the suffering that he saw coming his way. We're blessed by Jesus' plea there because it tells us we needn't feel guilty about similar wishing there was a way out. Whatever we face, though, we are consoled by the knowledge that because of Jesus' saving work, he knows that pain and we enter into lasting rest because of Jesus' work. So the married sisters recognize that there are going to be times we want to push aside the pain. But we know that Jesus begged for the same thing. He lived through unbearable, literally unbearable pain and suffering. Uh, he is with us, and because of his work, we enter into rest with him. The Widower's Hymn, the tune dates from 1539, probably an adaptation of an old Gregorian chant. Don't you love it that a lot of the, word, the music we know is Moravian music actually isn't, wasn't written by Moravians, it was brought in? We have always been eclectic. When we were introducing the Moravian Book of Worship back in 1995, somebody asked, is everything in this book by Moravians? And we said, no. And the next question was, well, why is it there? And Daniel and I were doing this trying to figure out some way to answer that question. I think what we came up with was that we have at least a 500 year history of borrowing the best of the, of the music and words around us. So it was very much in our tradition to keep using things. The words are by a reformed theologian, we're on the widower's tune now, reformed theologian who, li who lived in the uh, early 16th century. And here we see an affirmation of the constant experience of God's goodness and mercy. And we pledge to respond by clinging to Christ and to the church. And look at the final line, the final two lines of this. When called home, remember that phrase? When called home, I shall live there with Christ, my soul's redeemer. The sense that being called home that dying is a response to God's call, and it means living in Jesus' more immediate presence. 
That comes from John 14, chapter 3. Jesus says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. So there is that assurance that we will be with Jesus. So, um, recognizing that even in this life, God's goodness and mercies will follow us forever. This, th th these hymns do not present this life as a veil of tears, do they? There's some recognition of burden, but it's not that this world is awful. It, there's not this sense of, uh, this is awful, I can't wait till I die. It's a sense of, we're going to see as we go farther along that the world is good, but living with Jesus is going to be better. Turn the page, flying through. This is the widow's tune. Um, the text is by Henry and Louisa Fontaine. Anybody know what else, what are the words she wrote? Jesus, Jesus makes my heart rejoice. There's another one. I am, Jesus, little I am Jesus' little lamb, which is another translation of the same German. There's another one. What about the opening of the Easter dawn service? Hail all, hail victorious Lord and Savior. You have burst the bonds of death. That's Henrietta Louisa von Hain. She was, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, well there, she was leader, choir leader of the older girls and the single sisters choir in Herkut and wrote a great many hymns. Um, by the way, the text to Jesus Makes My Heart Rejoice was written for a friend of hers as a birthday present. Yes. Don't you love it? Well, now, this one, this one the, the, the syntax is a little awkward here. There's two sentences in this whole hymn, but they don't break where the music breaks. The first sentence is, lift your burdened hearts on high, all who you learn, yearn for healing where your hopes forever lie. Sense and thought and feeling, take no flight from the light shining forth in gladness where is no more sadness. She's talking to her own self. Don't run away from the light that you see coming. The light is shining in gladness where there is no sadness. Don't run away from it. Let's do take a break and sing this one so you get the sense of how the music and the words break at a different time. One nice anthem setting of this, too, by uh, Francis Florentine Hagen, the composer who wrote the music to Morning Star. Um, also recognizing in this hymn that, yes, we do sometimes have burdened hearts. And that's okay. That's okay. Uh, single Brothers. This is a really familiar tune to us as Moravians. Yep. We think this tune originated in Herrenhut around 1735. There's like a dozen of these identified as Herrenhut tunes. The ones that really became well known to us and well loved to us that we can't, we don't know of an earlier origin. Um, they were identified as early as 1745 as being associated with Herrenhut. We don't know who exactly wrote them. Um, it's possible that they were written by Tobias Friedrich who was the first organist at Herrenhut. If you want to know about Tobias Friedrich, ask Richard Starbuck. <laughs> uh, the first sentence of this one also is a little awkward in the English. This is a Zinzendorf text. Uh, that, that translating Zinzendorf is tough, but this is, this is an anonymous Moravian translation from a couple of hundred years ago. Um, in, in German, the syntax, in a compound sentence, the, the principal verb is always at the end of the sentence. So when you're translating from German, you, you spend a lot of time chasing the verb. You know, it might be a six-line sentence, and the verb is way down there. Uh, 
So putting it into English prose, what this sentence is really saying is, Lord, you are my matchless friend. And while I'm here on earth, my only joy will be to adore and serve and obey you. Now that makes sense. But what you hear here is, faithful Lord, my only joy and pleasure shall remain while here I stay. You, my matchless friend and highest treasure, to adore, serve, and obey. Notice the verbs are at the end of that sentence. So it makes it tough to follow the sense of this when you're hearing the choir sing it. Um, second half of the verse recognizes that even in our frailty, we trust that when God calls us, God also gives us the needful gifts to carry out God's will in spite of our weakness. Though I in myself am weak and feeble, yet our trust, I trust your grace will me enable by obedience to your will all your purpose to fulfill. Against verbs at the end. So the single brothers recognize that their call to a life of faithful service, knowing that their joy is in serving their faithful Lord and that they don't have to do it alone, but that since their Lord is faithful, he will give them everything they need. There's a word for us. When God calls, God equips. Uh, turning the page. Single sisters. They also are called to faithfulness. And this is another of the Hoot tunes, but it's one that's fallen out of use among the American Moravians. I'm sorry for that. Uh, they just aren't words that we use in our regular worship that, this, that go with this tune, and they haven't been for the last couple of hymnals. Uh, Again, the single sisters recognize that, that their peace and their joy is to follow the Lamb. Um, be this my only care, each step to hallow. Let everything I do be holy. And thus I wait the time when Christ will call me hence, call me home, to live with him forever. But during that waiting time, our joy is to follow the Lamb. That's it. So. The older boy's tune is another Johann Kruger tune. Um, you see that in the footnote, in the 1791 liturgy book, only the first half of this tune appears. So this one would be... continuing it in your head. <laughs> so Daniel and I in editing this booklet recognized that and so we found another hymn that the second the words of the second half were compatible with the words of this first half and we added it. So this is not historical as to what would have been done. This is what we did to make it uh, work now. Second half words by the way are by Anna Nitschmann, second wife of Zinzendorf. Um, do you know of instances now where we only use one half of a hymn tune? I know of two. Yep, in the Friday of Holy Week reading, sing with all and strains melodious, sing with all, behold the man. And this one, that one does end at an awkward place. It doesn't, it, it, you know, you're, you feel like you're falling because it doesn't resolve. There's another one. It's in the funeral service in the procession. Right up here in front of the bishop's house, we sing the second half of the Passion Chorale. Grant me to lean unshaken upon your faithfulness till I from earth am taken to see you face to face. Those are the only two instances I know of now where we commonly use just a half of a hymn tune. But that was a norm a couple hundred years ago, using a verse or half a verse. Kind of cool. So in this verse, as we have it, the older boys are called to recognize that Jesus' grace holds them close and blesses them with peace. And they're reminded that their soul need know neither fear nor sadness, but look to its final home gladly. So you don't, you don't, you're, you're in, you have peace, you are close to Jesus, you don't need to be afraid, you don't need to be sad. That's living here. And then you're looking forward to your final home with Jesus. The second half, the, the half a stanza that we added, um, has the boys praying to live a life resembling that of their Savior. 
to be blessed in their whole being, body, soul, and spirit by Jesus' merit, recognizing that the blessing comes from Jesus. Um, the tune to the older girls hymn is what we only have this tune now in the burial liturgy, and I think that's kind of a shame. It's the tune we sing with the committal, now to the earth let these remains in hope committed be until the body changed attains blessed immortality. There's a lot of joy in those words, isn't it? You know, you think of it, think about it. What? It really is. Uh, it, it feels like a very sad tune. This tune is the... Um, instinct. <laughs> we can do that. We can happy that up a little bit. Uh, but in the um, 1969 hymnal, there were two other uses of this hymn tune. Um, Lord, as to thy dear cross we flee, and there is a fountain filled with blood. So both of those are rather sad texts to go with this tune, but the, the, two, the, the words in the burial liturgy and here for the older girls hymn, those are joyful words. Those are not sad words. So I remember doing a study of the Lent liturgy um, years ago and realizing that so many of the tunes in there sounded like sad tunes, but the words are extremely happy. There's a lot of joy in there. What language shall I borrow to thank you, dearest friend? Those are joyful words. So there's a tension in there. The next tune, Little Boy's Hymn, um, is um, a tune that we know with what brought us together. It's another of the Heron Hoot tunes. Uh, and note that these words, the Lord to his fold, little children invites, his bounty, the lambs of his pasture delights. On earth, the good shepherd provides for our care, above in his presence, his joy we will share. This is joyful. Think about these, these little boys growing up thinking about the delights of living now under the care of the good shepherd. Uh, nobody's telling them that life is awful. They're telling them that life is joyful because you follow Jesus in his good pastures and then you look forward to sharing his joy in his presence. Again, life is good. Life with Jesus eventually is going to even be better. Um, and then the little girl's hymn is verse 3 from Jesus Makes My Heart Rejoice. Check the imagery again. We are sheep leaping for joy in Jesus' pasture. Uh, and again, what's the picture of this life? <coughs> and when these blessed days are over, these days on earth are blessed, and then we'll be called to the Savior's arms to rest. So there's a lot of joy in this verse. When these blessed days, I love that image. And when, whenever I sing this, I try to think about what is it about these days that are blessed? Okay, before we look at the final hymn and see how much time we have to sing, what are the common themes? Do you hear common themes in all of these verses? I do. Jesus never forsakes us. Jesus cares for us throughout our whole life, always. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Even in the sorrows and burdens of this life, and there are some, Jesus is with us. He knows our pain, he has experienced it, and he blesses us with peace, even in our sorrows. Following Jesus in this life brings joy, peace, and gladness. Even in our burdens and sorrow, following Jesus brings joy, peace, and gladness. Death is not to be feared, for after these blessed days on earth, we will be called home to his more immediate presence, to rise in his image and live forever with him in joy. No wonder then if these words were learned by heart and lived over and over and over. No wonder that in so many circles the Moravians were known as the Savior's happy people. That's who we're called to be. So the final hymn, now you know somebody died, oh it was a single sister, the final hymn is the Passion Chorale tune again. Looking at these words, we hear these words 
at home church with every death announced in worship, and we note a few things. Dear Lord, when I am dying, this returns us to the thought of the first hymn, that I'm going to be called home too. Do not depart from me, and to my aid then fly. Yeah, it's a little normal to be a little afraid and apprehensive and saying, don't leave me, Jesus. You know, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, come, come fly, come grab me. You know, and I was just talking with uh, Charles about this before we started. To my aid, then flying, I, I never interpreted it in terms of Jesus on wings, but in terms of how, how if somebody needs you, you fly across the room, you just run. To my aid, then flying, when I'm dying, come be, come be with me and set me free. These eyes, new faith, receiving. Receiving! Faith isn't something we do. It isn't something we make up. It's something God gives us. And when we most need it, God's going to give it to us. New faith, receiving. Our task is to be open to receive that gift. The one who dies believing dies safely through his love. What does this not say? It doesn't say a thing about the person who dies not believing. It doesn't say that only the one who dies believing dies safely. This is being sung by people who believe and who know Jesus, and this is a reminder that I'm safe. Now, it doesn't say that those who didn't know him aren't safe. Moravians have never said that. They leave that the, the, the ultimate fate of those who don't know Jesus is in Jesus' hands, not ours. Our job is to share the news that we know, not out of fear, but out of love, recognizing how much better our lives are for knowing Jesus. This is our promise. This is a promise God has given to us, and it can only strengthen our faith to do like the 18th century Moravians would do and memorize these things. So, okay, why do we not, and here at home church, how come we don't sing the first Passion Chorale, the one that announces death? It's because the pastor speaks it. The pastor tells us someone has died and who it is. So the pastor's introductory words serve the function of the first Passion Chorale. The pastor has told us that a pilgrim, us preceding, in grace has been called home. About 22, 23, 24 years ago, Home Church reinitiated the practice of death announcements. We did it at first with the band playing them all. This was really challenging because sometimes you got short notice and you were making phone calls on Saturday night to see if you could get a group together, and sometimes you didn't have all the parts. Oh, it was a real challenge. Then we made the move to um, having the band play death announcements once a month. Then we finally shifted some years ago to having the choir sing them, and I think that's great. I think that's a real good move because we don't have these words by memory. Hearing the band plays, it doesn't tell us anything about what the words are. So hearing the words reminds us of what this is about. It's about the words. So how can we make these death announcements even more meaningful? We can memorize the words. Start with the closing hymn. Dear Lord, when I am dying, you're going to hear that a lot. Back up to your own choir hymn, and then move outward to the others. In my dreams, what would make these even more memorable and more um, meaning meaningful would be if we all sang them. <laughs> I didn't go on to the end to the, the section of the booklet about the burial service and the like. Um, a lot of this is uh, the tunes that are the rest here are the ones that are used here at home church. Um, there's the second half of the Passion Chorale. Um, then the band play stops at the gate of God's Acre and plays tune 168A, Jesus' Source of My Salvation. Um, and then um, tune 205A is often played. It's the, the, the next page. Uh, Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. It's a Charles Wesley hymn. Um, the committal hymn, Now to the Earth Let's These Remains. The Savior's Blood and Righteousness. Uh, Sleep Thy Last Sleep is played for the burial or the funeral of a musician or often a pastor, uh, sometimes a pastor's wife, pastor's spouse. Um, so that's a, that's a wonderful, that's, by the way, that is one verse of about a three or four verse hymn. So, and the closing hymn, when we were building the Archie Davis Center, the uh, contractors were under contract that they could not make noise during a funeral in God's acre. 
They had to be quiet. More than once when we had a procession from here up to the graveyard and we'd make the turn at the gate, they'd hear the band playing up at the top of the hill just inside the graveyard gate. We'd make the turn and go down past the building and the, the workers on the building would be standing lined up at the building with their hard hats over their hearts. Yes, it just really got to you. Uh, they were always quiet, but they got to know what is often the final hymn played at the graveyard. Uh, they got to know this thing. They would hear... Um, begin to get ready and about the time you'd hear the amen you'd hear and then you'd hear there goes the engines <laughs> back to work <laughs> when did they stop playing them here i don't know exactly i remember they were doing them when jim hancock was was young because he remembers getting out of school and coming down here and playing from the um, top of the boys school where the boy, uh, board, of Christ, uh, board of Cooperative Ministries is now. You could get excused from school to go play a death announcement. So, yes. I read a book the other year about Christian funerals. It was by Thomas Long. And the title of the book is Accompany Them With Singing. And his whole premise is that we ought to accompany the, the body to the graveyard with music and sing while we're there, to sing them home. And I'm thinking, that's ours. All right, let's sing one before we call it a night. Older boys, Jesus grace me here possessing. Jesus. 